We return with part two of the look at Gustave Courbet, and we really do start part two with, with probably the most famous work that he did, uh, The Artist's Studio, also known as A Real Allegory, Summing Up Seven Years of My Artistic and Moral Life, uh, a title so long it almost takes the whole video to say it. Uh, but again, when you look at this, this is really thought to be kind of the masterpiece, even by Courbet's mind, of kind of the early part of his career. Uh, when we look at this, it's really easy to, to kind of look at the canvas itself. It's easily divided into the right and left sides with Gustav uh, sitting in the very, very middle working on a landscape with uh, a nude, of course, looking over his shoulder. And then we have a younger boy uh, almost looking up in admiration. Uh, and you, of course, have to notice the cat on the floor playing with whatever. Uh, so when we look at this, the way it really is divided uh, is on the right side, this is thought to be Gustav's friends and acquaintances. Uh, we, if you look very closely in the right corner, we of course have uh, Baudelaire one more time. Uh, we look off into the distance there and we can see uh, a bearded fellow. This is uh, Proudhon, uh, another one of his friends. So again, Behind him, or, or on the right side of the canvas, what we have are uh, uh, the positive aspects of his life, if you will. We then move over to the left side, and uh, this is thought to be the negative aspects of life, or the negative things uh, that Gustav is perceiving. Uh, we, of course, see the skull as much as anything else. Uh, but of particular notice, we have a man sitting in a chair uh, with a dog, kind of in the, in the rue of, of being a... Uh, a hunter, this is supposed to be the guise of Napoleon III, and again, when we think about uh, the culmination of events that's happening between uh, the Franco-Prussian War and what will be coming with the Paris Commune, uh, again, we need to remember that although he's perceiving himself, or at least projecting himself, rather, as being this kind of, uh, you know, from the sticks type of person, he is very much politically involved. A uh, woman on the Seine River, again, when we look at this and we look at kind of this new vein that we see occurring uh, within the work of Courbet as we move away from the artist's studio, kind of representing the second half of his life. Uh, we still kind of see what we think of as primitive people in, in connection to things, but it becomes a lot more erotic in nature and, and again, uh, a lot more playful and, and even by some arguments a little bit more ornamental uh, in a lot of his works. Again, uh, these would be most likely women uh, that you would be able to find company with, we'll put it that way, uh, on the banks of the Seine River. Uh, so in this way, he's kind of doing a, a, a predecessor of that idea as well. Uh, here's one of his paintings we have at the Dallas Museum of Art, and, and again, we have a very kind of Courbet image here, the fox in the snow. This is kind of his take, uh, if you will, on the, 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 the animal landscape painting, and what we have is a fox, but you'll notice uh, the fox has, of course, caught its prey uh, and is ripping it apart. So in this beautiful landscape, again, uh, with these animals, Corbet is kind of showing the reality of the existence of, of what would really be occurring in this situation with the fox uh, actually mutilating uh, its catch and, and uh, consuming it in, in a very savage type of manner, uh, rather being than being this elegant creature that we kind of remove uh, from its basic nature. And again, when we think about Gustave Courbet, when we think about uh, this kind of aspects about him, uh, this is kind of in keeping with, with what we have um, in the earlier part of his career. As I mentioned, he kind of goes in a different vein, and uh, this is a, a good example of one of the safer images that we have. Uh, as he continues along his career, he uh, starts to paint uh, more and more nudes in kind of these remote settings, if you will, and a lot of them are named things like the source, uh, uh, and a lot of them have waterfalls and this type of thing, where uh, he's really kind of going for more of an erotic edge. Uh, and again, a lot of the images that he's produced at this time, honestly, are, are almost borderline pornographic to the point that I, I wouldn't even feel comfortable uh, necessarily showing them in a lecture. So uh, if you're very curious about it, you might want to 
check out Gustave Courbet's later uh, paintings. There's another painting called The Source at the end of his career uh, that I'm thinking of in particular that, that you might want to look up for your own uh, bemusement, if you will. <clears throat> Here we have a portrait from 1865 of Joe, and uh, this is an interesting one because the woman, of course, has red hair, and uh, I'm not 100% sure if this is a woman, but we do have a red-haired woman that we see uh, also in, in several of his other paintings that we also see in uh, paintings by James Whistler, and this is a model uh, that was actually a model slash lover of Whistler at a time, uh, and they actually she decided to also model for Courbet, and the two of them got into uh, an argument about that, and that was actually the ending of their friendship. But again, uh, when we look at the work of Courbet from this period, we do see a lot of variety. Uh, but again, we also see him very much moving away from a lot of the thematics uh, that we were embracing in the first video with Again, this idea of showing the rural aspects of everyday life, uh, this concept of realism that he's really pushing forward. Here we have a portrait of Madame Proudhon, uh, wife of the philosopher uh, that we, we mentioned earlier. Again, uh, just normal portraiture work, very similar to what we saw uh, of, of the portrait of his sister, if you will, from the very, very early parts of his career. But again, these are just friends uh, and associates that we have with him. Uh, these are nice kind of simple portraits that we have uh, uh, him producing. Again, uh, these are kind of amazing if you look at his technical skill in particular, if you look at the flowers uh, that are kind of forming uh, Madame Proudhon's bonnet, there's a tremendous amount of interlace there and a tremendous amount of overlay with shadow uh, creating this wonderful sense of texture. And as we move down, uh, we see some more of these kind of flatter planes that we associate uh, more with Gustave Courbet. We know that in a lot of his work, he actually used uh, the palette knife in addition to using a brush. Uh, here we have uh, uh, Pierre-Joseph with uh, Proudhon with his family. And again, just a reminder of uh, kind of the political activities that uh, we kind of see Gustav kind of taking part in. And again, we're getting closer and closer to uh, what we think of as the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, and what occurs within that is we have an actually uh, a war that is kind of started for particular, for peculiar reasons, excuse me, but by the end of it, what you have, uh, there's a siege of Paris, and Paris is pretty much, uh, large sections of it are destroyed, and again, we look at this as, as one of the modernizations that we have of Paris at the time as well. Uh, we need to remember that most of the people that we think of as the Impressionists are also alive at this time, and they're being, uh, although they're younger, they're still being exposed to uh, this work by Courbet, especially when we think of kind of the next uh, direct generation people like, again, uh, Manet and Degas. Another piece from the Dallas Museum of Art, Rodier uh, at a stream. Again, when we see this kind of later career, in addition to these very, very erotic portraits that he does paint of women, a lot of it are just kind of these very, very simplistic landscapes, uh, uh, very, very much uh, nature-oriented, almost as if you were looking at uh, a field guide for hunting or something of those natures. Again, uh, I think that he found some type of purity uh, of consciousness, and, and within his own mind, uh, he was looking for some type of natural understanding. And again, uh, when you think about the artist going forward, especially the post-impressionist, this idea of removing yourself from society, especially the now mechanized society that uh, is a product of the Industrial Revolution, and really removing yourself back to the primitive is, um, is one of the ideas we kind of first associate with Corbet. Uh, so we move to the Verdun column uh, issue, and again, what happens next is is after uh, immediately after the siege of Paris, what you have is you have the Paris Commune, where the communists essentially take over Paris for a while, uh, and then you essentially have Napoleon's troops coming back in, and there's a, a huge massacre of a lot of the people. Uh, but you have this very famous column that was toppled, uh, and it was kind of 
put on Corbet is a good way of putting it. He wasn't directly responsible for the toppling of the column, uh, but if you look in the photo on the left, he's actually pictured in the photo, uh, in the group, kind of in the background. If you look very carefully, look for the long beard, it's always Corbet. And earlier he had kind of written a letter uh, saying that this statue should be removed uh, because of what it represented or how it was representing those things. So essentially uh, he's put into exile uh, from Paris. They, they essentially give him the bill, if you will, uh, to pay for the renovation of this statue and, and he doesn't have the money to do that. So uh, he's put into to exile. Uh, and, and before, excuse me, before he's put into exile, he's actually put into prison for a while. Uh, and that's actually what we're looking at. This is kind of uh, these, these series of, of um, one of 15, as it says, uh, still lifes that he did from prison, these very, very simplistic paintings. And again, when I say prison, uh, you, you can kind of, I imagine, much more of a house arrest type of atmosphere. Uh, obviously, if he was allowed to paint still lifes, he wasn't in what we would really construe as a very stringent prison. But uh, again, towards the end, very, very end of his life, uh, what we see is another very radical change because he can't get to the same subject matter he could before uh, again when he's in prison and then uh, again as I mentioned uh, he is put into exile in Switzerland I believe towards the very very end of his life he actually works it out so that he can return uh, but he never quite makes it and again I think that this is a a wonderful painting from the end of his life, uh, the trout. He dies in 1877 from complications, uh, from a life of, of living a very, very uh, heavy life of drinking and enjoyment is a good way of putting it. Uh, a very robust person, uh, both in terms of personality, but also in terms of physique. Uh, I think, again, when you think about his career and how much he meant to kind of the Paris uh, uh, commune and that whole ideology and how much he changes things, uh, this seems a very appropriate painting uh, to end our conversation uh, on Gustave Courbet with.